You're watching Photographing the World 4 Behind the Scenes. If you'd like to learn more about the full tutorial, check out fstoppers.com slash store. Oh, I just saw a skydiving. Uh, I just saw a zip line. Oh, and shut up. There was no skydiving. <laughs> I skydiving. just saw a billboard for skydiving. <laughs> While we filmed every single photograph in the world, we've tried to convince Aliyah to go skydiving. I don't know that we're ever going to be able to, but I also don't think we're ever going to stop trying. I'll tell you what, one of the most exciting things about being on the road all the time is laundry. Getting ready to do laundry. And there's three washing machines, and this must be a coincidence that every single one has a, a skydive advertisement in it. Man, I wonder... I wonder who would do such a thing. It's almost suggestive in a way. I'm thinking, obviously, Liam Patrick just somehow misplaced these. This is necessary reading material for them, so I'm just gonna make sure they have them. I'd hate for them to lose these. So this is the gimbal we've been using with the X-T2. This is the old one that we've been using, just the iPhone. This is the iPhone 7. And we're gonna do a comparison right now between the two. We're just gonna walk side by side and see what the footage looks like and see if it's worth carrying this gigantic camera and gimbal when this is an awesome option that's worked so well for us for years. Look at the size difference. Back in the hotel, Patrick did an A-B test to see if I could determine which camera actually looked best. It is pretty close. Camera one uh -huh. was iPhone. Camera two yeah. was Fuji. Wait, I said, cam I said the camera one looks best. Yeah, camera one, the iPhone looks the best. It does? Yeah, we should film all of our B-roll on the iPhone. <laughs> oh my god. Look how shaky it is. It's like jerking around and stuff, and look how smooth that looks. Oh no. Holy crap, I cannot believe I chose. So, the iPhone is looking better. The whole time we're carrying a <laughs> huge camera and gimbal, and the footage looks worse. Pick two frames that look kind of similar and zoom in to like 400% and let's see if we can see which one looks sharper. Go to the other one. That one looks sharper. That's the iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh, this kind of, I guess it's a good thing. Like we don't have to carry this heavy thing around anymore, but the problem is the only reason that we're shooting with Fuji in general is we've been hired to do this um, like commercial for them and they asked us to shoot as much as we can with the Fuji cameras but if we like the iPhone footage better should we be like hiking around with this big ass thing I am sh I thought for sure 4k footage out of the Fuji with the bigger sensor and the better lens and everything I thought for sure I'd be able to tell the difference yeah so I don't know why you're shocked by this but I mean it's just goes to show how good the iPhone is GoPro start recording Yes! So one thing so, our, uh, our car has is a, an AC jack, which is really nice I because it allows us to bring our bird's nest of uh, cords into the car where actually it's a little more productive. So we can uh, charge everything right here and create a nice I little fire hazard. Unlimited movies. Because we weren't in a national park, flying the drone was fair game. When flying from a car, it's always important to film at all times because you never know what's going to happen. Yes, Can just be careful it? not to show your insurance company. Can you see it behind us? Uh, we'll tell you. Our insurance company doesn't watch our YouTube. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Eliah then took us to lunch to break the news that for the next shot, we'd have to be getting up before 3 a.m. Can you see the excitement on my face? Here we are at the scouting location. Something tells me a photograph is nearby. I don't think that's good for the gimbal, right? It's brushless, so it's made for it. The next location, Mesa Arch. There it is. I think this is the spot we have to wake up at 2 a.m. to come back to. 
The view on the other side of this arch is more impressive than the arch itself. It's not that this arch isn't impressive, it certainly is. Uh, if it was just a normal arch that we happen to stumble upon, I would be blown away. But this thing has been shot so many times. Because everyone shoots this thing with a wide angle lens, I just assumed it was way bigger. But it's a pretty small arch. We gotta come back out here in like five hours in the pitch black and stay out all night to beat out all those people. Not looking forward to that at all. than what's already in my face. I'm just trying to record video. It's dark. Mm. This sucks. So last night, Naomi said that we needed to get up at 2 so that we could leave at 3. But in F-stoppers fashion, we got up with about 15 minutes to leave. And we are still early. So four hours before sunrise, Elias set up the camera to stake out his spot. Patrick and I walked around and set up time lapses. I've got the Tamron 15 to 32.8, and this lens has been awesome for stars. Uh, you can see I just have the focus set to infinity, and the moon is out right now, and these pictures look crazy. I'm shooting at 15 seconds, 2.8, ISO 2000. These pictures look like it's day. It's very, it's very strange. I hate to admit it, but Elia was right once again. Right before sunrise, the photographers started showing up. When I was scouting here yesterday, I anticipated exactly what was going to happen with the crowd. Most of the research that I did with Mesa Arch in general had everybody shooting on the other side, the popular side of the arch, because that's where if you have a super wide lens, you can get the entirety of the arch, or you can do a pano, or you can kind of frame in. So my anticipation was most people who arrived would immediately go to that side, and then anybody who couldn't find a position or wanted something different would end up coming over here. So sure enough, after the first people arrived, a few dozen people started to come in and all hug this whole area just about up to the tree right behind me. And I stayed all by myself until some people had to come over here and treated this area of the arch kind of like a consolation prize, which I thought was really interesting because it was my primary composition for this location. So for a while, I thought it was going to be by myself, but a few photographers ended up joining me after it got too crowded over there. Once Elia got back into post, he was able to do a very simple edit on a very unique perspective. This image is looking really nice, but let's go ahead and take a look at how we started. Where did we start from this image? Let's go ahead and expand everything. We started with the original RAW. That's straight out of camera. Then we made Lightroom adjustments from here to here. The next thing we did is we addressed the highlights. So it gave us a really nice starburst and a blending point for the sky. The next thing we did though is we brought in the clean image. So you can see we got rid of all of those issues that we had from shooting into the sun. And then using this as a base, we actually brought in a little bit more color and texture from the sky. From there, we brought in the focused version, masked it in manually. Lastly, we used a camera raw filter to just bring all those colors and values back to life 
unify them together, create a harmonious blend. The last thing that we did is created a dodge and burn layer. Today's lesson is going to be a multi-row panoramic image here in Utah, and I'm using a new system. It's for full-size cameras, and it has something called an index rotator, which is pretty cool. But check this out. This is the Nodal Ninja with the index rotator that allows you to click degrees in. So you just go click, 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 click as you take the photos, and it gives you more accuracy. This is huge, super heavy. That's for a full-size camera. This is the little lightweight kit that I travel with by Really Right Stuff. You can see that it doesn't really weigh much and all fits into this little bag. So serious panoramic images with giant cameras and long lenses, serious panoramic images with medium and wide lenses using mirrorless cameras. Awesome. Hello everybody and welcome to Canyonlands National Park. We are at a beautiful viewpoint called Dead Horse Point. When you look down, you understand why it's a scary name like that. I can imagine somebody hundreds of years ago coming up here on horseback and thinking, man, how am I gonna get around this giant canyon? Honestly, it looks like a mini version of the Grand Canyon. It's hard to register scale, depth, or anything because it's just so vast. This place makes me want to fly my drone more than anywhere else we have ever shot, but we're trying to follow the rules and the laws here, and they do not allow drone photography during summer months, and I guess that starts in March. So it's kind of frustrating that I have a Mavic right now with me in my backpack. It's like a little toy. It couldn't hurt anybody anyway. Plus, there's not a single soul out here, but I am not supposed to fly the drone, so we're not gonna do it. So what I'm actually gonna do is do a multi-row panoramic image because one, it's a huge panoramic vista already, and two, there is a massive amount of detail. There's a road down there, the Colorado River, all these little mountains and rocks down here. I wanna be able to get everything in this landscape into a single stitched image. I think that's gonna be the best way to capture the magnitude and mass of this incredible location. I think this camera is going to get blown off this mountain. I'm going to warn Aliyah, and then if this thing flies off, the project is done, and we're out 10 grand. It's so windy up here right now. You can see Aliyah's hair flying around. Aliyah, are you comfortable with your other camera sitting on the edge like that? And this wind, you're good? Yeah. Okay. Patrick literally just dove and caught <laughs> I saw it. it. I saw it like barely moving. I was like, son of a bitch. Oh my gosh. And in case anybody wants to know, yes, this is a an endless cliff off the side there. <laughs> It'll be fine. Dude, I just I just don't <laughs> think it's worth the risk. I have done this many times. It is set up like I each foot is like in this little like rocky little Alco crevasse. It's fine. This wind is wild out here. This wind's ridiculous, man. Like, and Patrick had to dive for his. Let's get right into the way this is set up. Just like every other panoramic gimbal image that I've been working on, I made sure that the tripod is level. I've used the micron level here on the nodal slide to make sure that that's perfectly level. And I've made sure that everything rotates properly. This index rotator has a couple different plungers. These are actually called plunger knobs. On the left here, and remember you can orient it any way you want, but currently on the left, the large plunger, if I tighten that down all the way, it stops all of the rotation. If I loosen up a little bit, that engages. What's really special are these plunger knobs. You get two knobs and the main plunger here, and on the end of the knob here is a little spring-loaded ball bearing. When this makes full contact, in other words, when you plug this in all the way, 
it will determine at what points and what degrees of rotation this stops on. Luckily, Elias' $12,000 camera did not blow off the cliff, and we came away with an incredible looking shot. Stay tuned for next week's episode when we do one of the most unique hikes in the entire world. To learn more about photographing the world for, head over to fstoppers.com slash store.